Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the talk that I'm going to give today is on uh, a, t- a topic which was covered in a Quran Majid course uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Fawad Naeem and uh, Rizwan Zameer, uh, which is on Islam and modernity. And uh, you know, they, in their lectures, they covered you know, quite a great deal. So I'll just be drawing some points uh, from what they raised. Obviously, I can't uh, 20 minutes cover uh, very much. And basically, this topic is a very vast one and can't really be covered in one meeting. If I have time, then I'll, and I'll, al- I'll also add a little bit in addition to what they uh, raised on uh, the engagement of Islamic thinkers with modernity, which is a topic that I had uh, studied separately um, during, during my master's. And uh, we'll try to add that to their uh, discussion. So uh, to begin, um, when we're talking about, the, uh, about Islam and modernity, um, and two very big concepts <coughs> which are not uh, necessarily uh, amenable to any one definition. Um, but when we're looking at the impact of modernity on Islam or on, or on let's say, uh, more accurately or on, on Muslims, uh, we can start by looking at the period of colonialism as being the, uh, you know, in general terms, as being the, uh, the time when, when most of the, when, when, uh, when this impact really happened in a, uh, a great, and a, and a created form. And as far as colonialism is concerned, you know, it's, uh, one might argue, okay, you know, there, there were different conquests back and forth. Muslims sometimes conquered other non-Muslims, and vice versa. As what was, you know, colonialism, yes, was very big. I mean, by the by the by 1914, the European powers controlled maybe 85 percent of the globe. Uh, but more than the actual territorial acquisition, what was important was the was the fact that this was a very changing time and a time when. Uh, when society and economy was being transformed globally on a vastly unprecedented scale. Um, so consequently, the European powers that, uh, through colonialism, um, you know, in a sense, brought modernity to the Muslim world were, were operating in a, out of a, a completely different mindset and a completely different um, societal function. And, uh, and there were a number of social changes which led uh, to uh, to the fact of the, the European powers being so very different from the people they colonized. Um, you know, there were a series of you know, quite dramatic social changes in Europe over the centuries. There was uh, the Reformation, which broke the strength, uh, the authority of the church. Uh, then, years later, there was the Enlightenment uh, in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, which accompanied the, the scientific revolution, uh, and which, for our purposes, you know, uh, led to uh, quite different modes of thought. There was a great emphasis on, on rational thought. Uh, there was a great emphasis on empiricism uh, as by the means by which to organize um, natural philosophy. Um, and all the, and these viewpoints and these thoughts that were developing during that period were not necessarily anti-religion, although some of the Enlightenment thinkers, such as Voltaire or Rousseau, were very critical of the church. Um, there were others, like I mean, uh, other thinkers were you know, quite committed believers themselves. But they, although this thought was not necessarily anti-religion, uh, its reference points were all non-religious. So the worldview that is operating is a worldview that's operating independent of religion. It's a worldview that, whereby um, religion you know, is maybe there, God may be there, but it's not influencing in any way the kind of thought processes that are being, uh, that are being carried out. Um, and, and which are then being seen as the basis of society. So that was a, that was a worldview which was very different uh, and that was the worldview that was animating, particularly in its later stages, colonialism. In the earlier stages, there was still, uh, at least in, 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 um, among, uh, for example, British uh, colonialists, quite a religious bent. But these processes were happening uh, gradually. Um, similarly, the, uh, this was going alongside the wholesale transformation of society after the, scient- after the industrial and scientific revolution. Um, which, you know, uh, at a societal level, led to mechan- mechanization, to mass production, 
uh, to uh, you know, uh, global uh, you know, transport that would you know, traverse the globe in much uh, shorter periods of time, and led very importantly again uh, uh, from a religious perspective to such developments as printing, which then allowed uh, religious books and authorities to be produced on, on a mass scale uh, not seen before. Uh, so there were all these changes taking place and, uh, in Europe, and as the uh, colonies found themselves integrated into the European economy on an unequal level, those changes also began to have their impact uh, there. Um, and part of the, part of the European uh, project, colonial project, part of the justification for European imperialism was that of you know, what was was a, was the notion that uh, that by uh, by imperialism Europe was bringing a greater standard of civilization to the colonies, uh, and so you have various um, ways in which this is formulated. From the British side, you have the white man's burden. Uh, in uh, the French, uh, take its mission civilisatrice. Uh, you know, the idea that you know the colonial subjects. Again, uh, very unevenly and to differing extents, depending on the different colonizers, depending on the different uh, co circumstances of colonies. But in just in a very general sense, uh, the idea of imparting that part of this mission included imparting uh, colonial education uh, to the you know, the uh, unfortunate savages uh, of of the colonies. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the kind of underpinnings of Enlightenment thought and of, uh, the, of uh, that, and then as I you know, just briefly covered, uh, those came into this uh, educational mission. Uh, and that immediately uh, you know, creates I, possibly a challenge, but if not a challenge, certainly a tension between the worldview um, you know, commonly within the Islamic world, the uh, Islamic world, the world with which uh, Muslims were raised. Um, you know, one, of the, uh, one of the points which was brought out by uh, Rizwan Zamir in his, his presentation particularly had to do about the enlightenment challenge to Wahi, to divine revelation, the, the notion that, you know, that you know, because something like divine revelation cannot be proven through empirical methods, nor can it be proven through the the assumptions that underpin uh, rational thought as it's in its modern incarnation. The the basic assumptions they don't allow for uh, this kind of um, you know God speaking to man in that sense. And so, the very basis of Wahi becomes questioned, which is you know foundational to anything um, you know that is believed in Islam. I mean, if 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 you start you know, if if the if the idea of uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, receiving uh, divine revelation starts being in question, then you can start you know, questioning pretty much uh, everything and uh, everything. You're not left with any sort of basis on which to work. Um, and, and so, you know, that's of course a very direct challenge and was not necessarily a very explicit challenge in that way. But this, this, the, this kind of thinking, you know, at some point, you know, again, this push to kind of Explain things by rational means, even if it's even if you're accepting, okay, you know, divine revelation can happen and that did happen. It's still, if you're trying to explain rational, observable phenomena, then a lot of other things become difficult to explain. So, you have uh, the issues where, uh, and which you see in the writings of certain Muslim thinkers, uh, so Sayyid Ahmed Khan, for example, you see the sort of questioning or the attempts to explain away uh, things like miracles. Um, Mojazat, Jinn, Miraj, all of these are sort of explained away as uh, either metaphors or visions. They're, they're, uh, because you know, those things are not things that can be scientifically observed or scientifically proven by, uh, you know, by the methods that have been established. And so in order to rationally explain those in the holy books and still you know, just retain the respect for the holy books, they're taken in a very non-literal uh, non sense. Um, and this, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Rizwan mentioned, what this results is that uh, in uh, that the Quranic worldview, the worldview which Muslims are invited when they're studying the Quran to, uh, to examine a world, to 
place themselves, immerse themselves in a world which is primarily an unseen world. It's an invitation to the unseen. It's a world in which, uh, which you know, you're <coughs> constantly reminded of signs of Qiyamah. It's a world in which you're constantly reminded of the prophets and of their lives and of their uh, times. It's a, it's a world in which those lessons are sort of part of your everyday experience in life. That immersion uh, begins to recede when when empiricism reigns. Then that your consciousness is not no, does no longer immerse itself to that same extent, and so and as a consequence, it's not you know those things start seeming less and less real. You may believe in them. You may say, you say I have iman, but that that uh, does create a degree of tension, a degree of you know, non-lived. Um, experience in, in, in those beliefs. And that's, that's certainly a major transformation in, in the way that Muslims believed, in the way that they uh, comported themselves, in the way that they organized uh, their lives. Um, the other aspect of this uh, uh, that, that, is, uh, that you see in this period is the social effect. So as you know, colonial education became more entrenched and as it began to be seen as a route, you know, and that it was developed as the main route by which, uh, by which new administrators would be trained, new uh, the the intellectual elite of the colonies would emerge and would you know, be um, you know, working alongside the colonial administration. That sort of became the route whereby the you know, many of the brightest minds uh, in the, in the colonies start, started going into the system because that was the you know, the one way to respect, the one way to advancement, one way to attain some sort of influence and power. And ultimately it was this, very much this sort of Western inculcated uh, nationalist thought uh, which, uh, which proved fatal to, to the colonial empires because it, it was a sense of nationalism with which the first uh, in the leaders of independence in many of the colonies emerged. So people like Jinnah and Gandhi and Nehru, Sukarno in Indonesia, uh, lots of uh, you know, most of the independence leaders are not coming from a very traditional uh, religious background or, or from a background steeped in culture. They're coming from at least a very uh, you know, uh, from direct engagement with the Western education system, with Western modes of thought, um, and the nationalism that they are seeking to promote in the colonies does you know, owes a very clear debt to European nationalism, which led to imperialism in the first place. So. They, you know, they, that's not to say that that's the only response. There is also a more traditionalist response, which is, which is you know, a traditionalist response which either sort of maintains a certain indifference, um, uh, keep, keeps a certain certain distance from the uh, colonial uh, administration, and which tries to preserve um, you know its own sort of traditions. For example, at Darul Ulum Deoband, that was that was kind of the uh, the motivating uh, belief, the way, motivating approach. But you know that is seen as sort of an unsatisfactory or an unrealistic response uh, to many uh, of the colonies because the underlying incentives have changed because the basic structure of the economy has changed, uh, the basic structure of uh, politics has changed, and so many of those responses are now beginning to be seen as out of date. And one of the outcomes of this is that you know the intellectual elite, you know, as I said, the brightest minds, the people who sort of, uh, you know, the cultural and intellectual elite uh, becomes much more secularized, in effect. It becomes much more westernized, much more secularized. Uh, you know, this is the same, or like much more, well, prof professionalized, right, into, into this, uh, in, into the colonial administration. And you know, so the same sort of people who, you know, in an earlier day and age would, uh, would have become uh, ulama, because those were the scholars, those were the, the intellectual life of the community the ulama and the qazi and so on, people would have gone into those sort of professions. Many of those people now are going into colonial uh, professions instead, uh, becoming public administrators or becoming tax collectors for the colonial authorities. <coughs> now, so the, you have this sort of bifurcation where, um, you know, again, late in, in the 19th century, you still have, you know, many, you know, there are many prominent ulama who are like, very critical thinkers who are engaged with modernity and so on. But that over time begins to recede. Um, over time, um, you know, if you look at the present day and age, it's it's hard to 
uh, take so many name, famous names as you as you would be able to take about a century ago of uh, ulama who you know really, really had a major intellectual influence on uh, Muslim societies. So you know the the much of the intellectual elite again begins to shift to these systems of education, systems of uh, professional life, which have not, which are, uh, have, are to a degree separated from the religion, to a degree, you know, don't, uh, are not based around that, that world view. Um, and that is, you know, that is one of the major challenges today, is, is in terms of the, uh, these bifurcations and this lack of wholeness which many people perceive, you know, uh, between your profession and your religion, and so they, these are all become sort of discrete uh, components uh, of life. Um, I have a, just a few more minutes. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, talk quickly about uh, some of the attempts to engage with modernity through an Islamic lens, and so some of the. I mean, so that is the ideal attempt. Many, many, during this period, many Islamic, uh, many Muslims who were concerned about uh, modernity and who were concerned of you know, reformulating uh, religion in, in a modern world um, uh, began to engage. And, and the idea was to engage with modernity through an Islamic lens, and that's probably the ideal sense. But uh, you, know, uh, you can argue that in many cases it became a question of engaging with Islam through a modern lens. And those are you know, two slightly different, kind of fairly different approaches, um, or, and likely lead to different results. Again, in the early days, many of these people were ulama, were classically trained. The likes of um, Muhammad Abdu, who became uh, you know, the Grand Mufti of uh, Al Azhar, um, and Jamaluddin Afghani. Um, so, you know, in the early days, you still have uh, you know, ulama engaging that, but gradually over time, and I'm just basically going to talk about a few features of the stream of Islamic thought, uh, gradually over time you see that, that ulama training becoming separated. So more and more the modern thinkers are do, uh, don't have any training as ulama. Uh, the latter day thinkers, uh, and, and that's an also an outcome of, of, uh, of you know, what Francis Robinson calls the Protestantization of religion, where, uh, where the Quran becomes you know, much more widely available and accessible. and so. Now everyone is in a position to interpret it, and without without you know, the sort of classical training. So, so many of these are coming from non-ulama backgrounds. Um, generally, there's an emphasis on uh, reason and rationality. So, so for example, so there's this debate of between ijtihad and taqlid, and you know, the modern thinkers are very much in favor of ijtihad and against taqlid of uh, you. Know, the critical interpretation of of the sources, as opposed to the following of the rulings laid down by earlier uh, the heads. Uh, and then there's also uh, accompanying this. You know, that that's that's just in the cla legal fiki sense. In, in in a broader sense, this is uh, it's the hard. It also sort of becomes redefined from just uh, fr from its legal sense into just the use of reason or, or critical thought. So now it becomes something that not it's not. Something limited to a you know, classically trained mujtahid who has received an ijazah from accredited authorities, but something that you know, anyone who can pick up a Quran, a Quran starts saying, "Okay, you know, this is my understanding of this." Uh, so you know, that that's that's the, that's at the extreme uh, that it leads to. Um, you, there's also an emphasis on the return to sources. So there's a tendency among uh, among the, these thinkers to emphasize the Quran and Hadith, and this is the original uh, source of Islam, and to you sort of downplay the the whole intermediate history of scholarship of the like next several hundred years. The, you know the, the the Quran and Hadith are the are the uh, you know are the lodestones in a sense, and uh, you know those people well they were writing for their time, um, and that may or may not be true. But the fact is that the, that there isn't very much engagement with that classical history. It's now very much focused on uh, Quran and Hadith. Uh, and relatedly, there's sort of an idealization of the very early uh, Muslim community of the first one or two <coughs> generations, and a sort of a denigration of later Muslim history as uh, being something that was, you know, Islam uh, you know, fell away from its uh, true roots, and this was a time of uh, ignorance and so on, uh, ignoring you know many of the great accomplishments of that time in science and so on. And yes, uh, you know, but. Uh, and of course, there were many ways that those societies were fell short of the ideal, but that becomes a focus rather than 
rather than looking at them in sort of a balance of what did they achieve, what did they not. Um, so uh, finally, then uh, you know, this is sort of a stream of thought uh, which uh, is not only the, uh, what you would might concern consider the modern Islamic thinkers, sort of um, like the, the you, know, you might think of uh, uh, the likes of Fazlur Rema and the likes of. Uh, Muhammad Asad, these sort of people. This is not only that stream of thought, but this is also these. A lot of these emphases are there also in the uh, what what I, you know, call the political Islamists. So the likes of Maulana Maududi, uh, the likes of uh, Hassan Al Banna of the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, these tendencies are there uh, together. Again, these are people who are not very. Uh, they're not ulama. They are approaching at it, and they're, they're very much trying to reconcile Islam and modernity. So that is that that drives their process, uh, and there's very much this idealization of the past. Uh, the only difference between the or the main difference between the two really is, has to do with the idea of whether this is a political project or not, whether there's a, whether to set up an Islamic state or not. Um, and you know there have been various attempts to. Uh, set up that Islamic State, and I think the only really interesting one was that in Iran, where there was actually an attempt to engage with uh, quite a lot of uh, themes of Islamic thought. But in any case, um, I, I'm going to wrap up here and, and basically can talk more in the question and answers about different methods or thinkers. And sometimes, and I'm not, uh, this is not, and I'm not meaning to either criticize or uh, you know, sort of exalt these thinkers. I'm just saying that this is a major change from the way that Islam was practiced and the way that Islam was. Research and the way that you know who could speak with authority on Islam that those are all things that have changed and um, and broadened and there's good things and bad things in that uh, but one of the things that it does mean is that you know there's there's a lot less um, uh, cohesion and a lot less uh, certainty than there used to be uh, in the Muslim experience and uh, and, and, and consequently, there's, there's a lot of search for certainty, which can lead, lead in all uh, kinds of directions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions?